good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Javier Gonzalez from Universidad, Universidad Miguel Hernández de Elche, Spain. Uh, Professor Gonzalez um, has been a very uh, prolific researcher and actually among the pioneers in the vehicular uh, networking domain. Uh, he has um, uh, been very active with the IEEE uh, Vehicular Technology Society. Actually, he just stepped down as the president of that mm -hmm. society. Um, he is a distinguished uh, um, like to, uh, a distinguished speaker mm -hmm. of IEEE VTS. And today he will be talking about V2X networks for connected and automated driving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sumaya. Thank you, Sumaya, for first for the invitation. Thank you, uh, all the conference committee as well, attendees, for uh, the atmosphere. I really do feel this family atmosphere and this uh, small community uh, that works together. So it's my real pleasure and honor to be here uh, with you today. So yes, I will be talking about V2X networks uh, for connected and automated driving. But first, let me introduce what is the current status of connected vehicles. Actually, connected vehicles are a reality. As of today, according to data from Strategy Analytics, more than half of the vehicles that are produced worldwide are connected vehicles with embedded modems. If we look at the case of AT&T in the US, out of the 100 million mobile line subscriptions they have, 32 million correspond to connected vehicles. What is actually even more interesting is that out of the net, of the 2019 net additions, 40% of the net additions come from connected vehicles in comparison to only 23% from new mobile phone subscriptions. So what are connected vehicles as we, as, we, as we know them today? First, they're about infotainment. You probably all have seen these advertisements. Maybe you have one of these Wi-Fi hotspot vehicles that utilize a 4G mobile broadband connection to connect to the outside world. But connected vehicles are also about traffic management. Connected ve uh, the connectivity has transformed vehicles into real mobile sensors. Oop. Yeah. There were some challenges before, so <laughs> that's OK. The technology never fails, never fails to amaze us, right? So it worked yesterday. Today, everything is broken. <laughs> no, that's OK. I can continue. So I was saying that connectivity has transformed our vehicles into mobile sensors. As you know, your vehicles are connected are regularly transmitting data to applications such as TomTom, Waze, and so on, to better build a, a view of what is actually the current status. Actually, automotive transportation is, to be, is believed to be the second industry in terms of data generation. And some believe that in the future, manufacturers will make more money from data than actually from selling the cars themselves. And actually, OK. OK, we have seen a glimpse of that uh, with Tesla Autopilot. When you know Tesla Autopilot, from the point of view of autom automotive uh, sensor technology, it's not really that innovative. But, it's also, but it has been very innovative in understanding the car as a compu big computer software that you can make revenue once actually you sell it. Because the Autopilot function, you can buy a car with the sensors and not the Autopilot function. And then pay an additional, now it's going to increase to $8,000, download the software that allows to utilize the sensors for the autonomous driving function. So actually, the softwareization of vehicles is allowing all these new functionalities. Vehicles nowadays, high-end uh, high vehicles, have between 100 to 200 million lines of code. That is compared to, for example, 7 million lines of code of a 787 Dreamliner, the, the last uh, Boeing plane. So, Softwareization is very good for all these functionalities, but also brings the software reliability problems. Actually, in the US, last year, nearly half of the vehicle recalls into garages were due to software or electronics problem. So actually, the industry is working very hard and betting very hard on what we call the over-the-air updates, the utilization of wireless connectivity to be able to solve a problem that is software or ele even electronics remotely with a software update without having to call the vehicle to the garage. That is vehicles, actually connected vehicles today. In the short to medium term, connected vehicles will be about connecting the vehicles to everything, not just the typical 
connection to the infrastructure, but also the possibility that vehicles directly communicate with each other to exchange some basic awareness messages that are referred to as CAMs in Europe or BSM in the US, to exchange some basic positioning and speed information so that vehicles can have a better awareness of their surrounding environment than just with their own sensors. You can connect vehicles, but you can also connect with pedestrians or other vulnerable road users. Thanks to the availability of this information, we'll be able to have in our vehicles active safety applications, where, for example, in this intersection collision avoidance, two vehicles are approaching an intersection and they don't see each other. If they are able to speak before they reach the intersection, they can detect in advance a potential safety risk and prevent it. Or electronic emergency brake light, where you can avoid chain collisions in highways if you don't depend only on the red visual light for a vehicle to react whenever another vehicle breaks. So if the first vehicle breaks, it can send a wireless message to all the vehicles behind. You reduce the time for the driver to react and therefore the probability of collision. The third generation of connected vehicles that is more medium long term will be about the intersection of connectivity and autonomous vehicles. When we talk of autonomous vehicles, we talk of vehicles that depend on their own sensors exclusively. So basically LIDAR, videos, or other kind of radars. With this information, the vehicles will detect the surrounding environment, fuse the information to create this database. For example, this is the typical map that Waymo shows around, where we basically represent what a vehicle is able to sense with its own sensors. And with this information, we basically control the vehicle. The problem of depending on their own sensors is that vehicles are limited by the capabilities of their own sensors. And sensors don't work well in these extreme conditions, at least extreme from the point of view of a South Mediterranean coast Spaniards. That is, for me, extreme conditions. But you don't need to be facing only these extreme conditions. Typical, for example, a scenario where you have an autonomous vehicle that approaches an intersection, and there are some pedestrians here. The vehicle will not be able to actually detect the pedestrians, and there's certainly a risk for safety. These problems can be overcome if we utilize V2X communications for vehicles to exchange their own sensor data. Thanks to this exchange of sensor data, for example, this autonomous vehicle does actually sense these pedestrians and notifies the incoming autonomous vehicles. Basically, what we do is extend the field of view of a vehicle beyond the field of view of its own sensors. This is what we call cooperative sensing or collective perception. Europe is actually leading the development and standardization of collective perception or cooperative sensing. The European approach nowadays is not for vehicles to exchange raw sensor data, but actually to exchange information about detected objects. Okay? So with this diagram, if we come back to this diagram, the vehicle will still use its own sensors to detect and fuse to have the map of the surrounding environment, but in addition, it will create a message that includes the information about the objects it has detected around, and it will transmit it wirelessly. In addition, it will receive the messages from other vehicles about what object it has sensed, and it will utilize this source of information as an additional sensor with actually larger field of view. With this new sensor, the knowledge of the surrounding environment can actually increase. And let me first show you how actually what we're doing in Etsy to define this collective perception. Basically, what we're first doing is defining the format. In addition to information about the transmitter that is sending the objects it has detected, it's very important also that vehicles exchange information about the sensor capabilities. Not all vehicles will have the sensor capabilities, so in order for a vehicle to know how it has to understand the information that is received by other vehicles, it needs to know which, with which sensors did the sending vehicle detect the objects. In addition, what we are currently defining in Etsy is the message generation rules. When should a vehicle transmit a collective perception message. It should transmit a collective perception message when it has detected a new object, or when any of the previously detected objects have changed their position by more than four meters, it has accelerated more than 0.5 meters per second, or the last time I reported about this detected object was one second. Even if none of this happens, the, cur the current HC standard that is still on draft mode Will, detect a, will transmit a CPM message every second, even if it's just to say to the other, uh, to incoming vehicles, I have not detected anybody else. 
So let me first show you the effectiveness of this cooperative perception or uh, collective perception or cooperative sensing approach that actually, if you are interested, you can find this analysis that has been conducted by Volkswagen and our lab in this Etsy technical report or our particular results in this IEEE vehicle uh, symposium conference paper. So I'm considering this highway scenario where we have vehicles equipped with forward sensors. In particular, with two sensors, the first one has 65 meter range and 40 degrees field of view, and the second one has 150 meter range and five degrees uh, field of view. We consider that if there is a vehicle blocking, then I cannot detect the other vehicle. So let's first consider the case of autonomous vehicles equipped with these forward sensors. And in this figure, we plot the object awareness ratio, which is the probability that in one second, I have detected an object as a function of the distance from me to this other vehicle, or to this object that I want to detect. We can see that if we depend on forward sensors, I can detect only with 0.45 probability any vehicle that is around 30 meters. The probability to detect vehicles significantly decreases, for example, up to 100 meters. We can increase the sensing capabilities if we now equip, like some car manufacturers are currently doing, the vehicles with 360 degree sensors. Okay? Obviously, that increases the cost of the vehicle, but it does increase the sensing capabilities. For example, you can reach close to 0.9 probability of detecting any vehicle 30 meters away, and even 0.5 at 80 and 90 meters. But that is only dependent on their own sensors. Now, let's see what happens if vehicles are able to exchange the information they have detected about other vehicles. And actually, we can see that thanks to the V2X exchange of detected objects, we can maintain 100% probability of detecting any vehicle that is up to a distance of around 320 meters. And more interestingly, is we get actually the same performance whether the vehicle is equipped with forward sensors only or with 360 degree sensors. So actually V2X communication can also reduce the cost of sensors in vehicles. Of course, this has been done considering a 100 penetration rate of V2X. If you have a lower penetration rate, of course you will get lower performance, but it will be within these two boundaries the best and actually the lowest. So that is to illustrate the benefit of connecting autonomous vehicles, but this is not exempt of challenges. Actually, currently, the, the way we are approaching collective perception is exclusively based on the vehicle dynamics, and we have found that this has some inefficiencies. This is actually the, pack, the PDF of the number of objects in each message that is transmitted. The messages that are transmitted not only include information about detected objects, but also about the transmitter and also about the sensing capabilities. The transmitter and the sensing, in a way, they are header or overhead. They are useful, but they are not detected objects. So basically what we are seeing is that because we are only depending on the vehicle dynamics, we are generating most of the messages with only one or two detected objects inside the message. And we know that when we are transmitting in a wireless channel that is very scarce bandwidth, and most of the information in a packet is headers, you are heavily inefficient in the usage of the wireless channel. In addition, we have redundancy. This figure represents how many times per second did I receive information about a given vehicle that is at a given distance. So basically, this shows that, for example, with 360 degree sensors, I can receive 45 times the same information about a vehicle that is 100 meters away. Because this vehicle, it will have an, one vehicle that detects it, another vehicle that detects it, another vehicle that detects it. If you talk with safety people in vehicles, they will say, wow, great, redundancy is great. Of course it's great. You can be more sure that you have actually detected well the vehicle. But it's completely useless if you congest the wireless communication channel and actually you don't receive the packets because you are transmitting too many times. And there's actually a gap in research here between the two communities because we're not getting feedback from the autonomous community of how much redundancy from V2X do you really need to actually be effective. So our understanding is that redundancy is good but you don't need that much redundancy. And we're actually working on mechanisms to reduce, to basically report about more objects per packet so that the headers on the wireless channels is smaller. 
and also to maintain certain redundancy, but one that is useful and does not, over, does, does not congest the wireless channel. Another benefit of connecting uh, autonomous vehicles is what we call cooperative driving. So to explain it, I'm going to show it with a video. Um, this was recorded by a person in a normal car, so it was not prepared. You might be aware that in the United States, several, several states uh, authorize OEMs to try autonomous vehicles in normal roads. That is basically to bring jobs to this state. So that was the case in Arizona. So this driver is actually in Arizona, and he has spotted a, a Waymo car. You can see here the logo, and it's an autonomous car. You can see the li uh, leader here. So this autonomous vehicle is trying to enter a highway that is quite dense. So let's see basically what happened. So in this case, the autonomous vehicle is completely autonomous. So there is no wireless connectivity. It will wait until the continuous line is over to try to enter the highway. Okay. So when the line is over, you can see it gives a signal and tries to find a gap. Autonomous vehicles are programmed conservatively. So they need to have a large gap to be able to do a, lay, a safe lane change maneuver. A normal driver here will start the maneuver, but the autonomous vehicle finds that this is not sufficiently safe and basically ends up without any time to do the maneuver and he has to leave. This vehicle, he could be the whole day going all around trying to enter the highway without any success. We can avoid this if we use V2X communication for vehicles to communicate and exchange information about planned maneuvers. Because ve autonomous vehicles nowadays work with what we call the sense, plan, and act approach. So an autonomous vehicle will sense the environment, it will sense with its own sensors, or you can use the V2X awareness bro broadcast messages or the collective perception messages that I just talked about. So they, they build the knowledge of the surrounding environment, then they plan, they calculate a trajectory to drive, and then they act. They modify the lateral or longitudinal control to be able to follow the trajectory. The problem is that the current planning is based exclusively on estimations or predictions of what other vehicles will do. And these estimations or predictions can be wrong. Why should an autonomous vehicle have to estimate or predict when it could use V2X communication to exchange information about the planned maneuvers to avoid these kind of problems that make more fun, but they have some safety issues as well? Okay, so we can use V2X communications for not estimating the trajectory of other vehicles, but directly exchanging, and this is what we call cooperative driving or maneuver coordination. I have to say I'm not funded here by the European Commission. I keep on saying Europe is leading the development, and it, but it's actually true. It's also leading the development of cooperative driving or maneuver coordination at the standardization level. We call it MCS. It's a, way, it's a bit behind collective perception, but uh, we are starting to uh, look at this carefully. The current approach is for vehicles to exchange trajectories locally. So V2X is mainly about local V2V communications. So two connected and automated vehicles that are driving are going to be regularly broadcasting their trajectory. What is regularly is yet undefined. We haven't yet decided how often should a vehicle exchange the trajectory. The planned trajectory is five to 10 seconds. So I'm not saying what I'm going to be driving for the next hour. It's just five to 10 seconds and the planned tra trajectory is collision free, okay? Then let's suppose that another autonomous vehicle wants to do a lane change maneuver here. In addition to broadcasting its planned trajectory, it's going to broadcast its desired trajectory. The desired trajectory is one that has a collision with the planned trajectory of another vehicle. There is no negotiation here. Right of way driving rules still apply. So this vehicle has the priority and is the one that is going to decide about this desired trajectory. If he wants to ignore it, he just basically doesn't do anything. He keeps on broadcasting his planned trajectory. However, if he wants the autonomous vehicle to do this maneuver, he will modify his planned trajectory, basically saying that he's reducing the speed so that it doesn't collide anymore with the desired trajectory. When this vehicle actually not, uh, notices that this planned trajectory does not collide anymore, it will basically do the desired trajectory. The current uh, Etsy approach is completely decentralized, completely v 2 base is based on the concept of broadcasting plan and design trajectory and right-of-way driving rules apply. The problem with this approach 
is that when you face certain scenarios where many of these maneuvers might happen at the same time, for, for example, a road wash area, and there is no coordination with vehicles, you can find yourself in a bottleneck. So what we're doing in a European project called Transaid is actually introduce the usage of a local infrastructure, where the local infrastructure does not mandate the maneuvers that have to be done, but advises the vehicles on the maneuvers that have to be done. Just like when you go to a world war shower nowadays, they put a traffic light, okay, to give you a message. At the end of the day, it's an infrastructure that is a neutral coordination, generally more trusted than maybe other vehicles. And in addition, it can have enhanced perception because it can have all the sensors and certainly additional range. So let me illustrate the benefit of this local V2I assisted cooperative driving that does not replace V2V. So the infrastructure only does give advices. Then the execution of the maneuvers is still V2V based. So we'll exemplify it with this use case with no automated driving zone. We're supposed that these connected and automated vehicles are approaching a not automated driving zone. And they have to do a transition of control. Okay, a transition of control is where the vehicle moves from automated driving mode to manual driving mode. So if there is no infrastructure assisted, this is what I consider the baseline, normally vehicles will start executing their maneuvers as they approach the non-automated driving zone. Okay? If we consider the V2I infrastructure assisted, the infrastructure can distribute in time and space the maneuvers of the different vehicles so that they don't suffer any safety risk. So we analyze these two approaches in different traffic uh, scenarios. Basically, CAVS is connected and automated vehicles, connected vehicles, non-automated, and legacy vehicles, okay? With different percentage of vehicles in this scenario. And in this figure, we plot for the, the, uh, the three different traffic mixes what we call the time to collision lower than three seconds. A vehicle experiences a safety danger if it experiences any possibility of a time to collision less than three seconds with any surrounding vehicles. So here we plot the number of times that vehicles experience this time to collision lower than three seconds. And basically you can see that the number of safety situations significantly decreases, the decrease is higher as the presence of autonomous vehicle increases if we utilize a local infrastructure in addition to the local V2V communications to coordinate the maneuvers. So what are the communications and networking technologies that we can utilize for all these V2X applications that we just talked about? Well, like anything that is wireless, we have basically two approaches, the Wi-Fi and the cellular camp as two possible options. The Wi-Fi one, which is known as IEEE 802.11p, is basically a simple evolution of the old 802.11a with 10 megahertz channel rather than 20 megahertz to be able to combat the Doppler effect at higher speeds. The technology at the standards level is known as DSRC in the US or ITSG5 in Europe. The cellular one is known technically as LTE V2X, but if you are not familiar to the community, you might have heard of it as cellular V2X. The real technical name is LTE V2X. So it's basically an evolution of 4G that was introduced by 3GPP in release 14 and improved in release 15. The main novelty is that in addition to the typical V2I communications that you can already do with, with 4G, they introduced for the first time what we call V2V side link or direct communication with, between vehicles with the, what we call is the PC5 interface. What is important is that it introduces two modes of communication. Mode three is where vehicles communicate directly with each other, but it's the infrastructure, the one that selects the communication channel and manages it to avoid interference. In the second mode, mode four, vehicles communicate directly with each other, but they also autonomously select and manage the channel. The reason being is that you cannot depend on the availability of cellular coverage to deploy, to sell a car with active safety features. So for, uh, for me at least, Mode 4 is the basic mode okay, of operation. Both technologies operate in the 5.9 gigahertz band in Europe and the US mainly, and they are multi-channel operation based, which means that in order to be able to detect another vehicle, we have a common channel that we call control channel, where all vehicles broadcast their position and speed so that other vehicles around can detect me. And if I want to do a dedicated communication with a given vehicle, I can switch to a service channel. So 
In terms of deployments, there's certainly a different status between the two technologies. Actually, .211p, even last year, so probably this figure you can, is hard to update it because they don't publicly release these numbers, but even last year there were already 120,000 vehicles equipped with a .211p worldwide, mainly because in Japan, since the end of 2015, they have been selling cars with a .211p. In the US, GM with the Cadillac CTS is including already this technology, and in Europe, we're waiting for the large-scale deployment from Volkswagen scheduled for this year. In terms of cellular V2X or LTE V2X, the chipsets are available since 2018, mainly from Qualcomm and Chinese manufacturers, and in vehicle commercial deployment, according to the 5G Automotive Association, is expected for 2020. Actually, Ford in the US made a huge announcement for 2021. Some Chinese manufacturers may accelerate this deployment date. So there is a lively debate in the community which technology is best, okay? The comparison I'm going to show here is going to be focused on V2V in mode four for LTE V2X, okay? Because this is for me the baseline mode of operation. Of course, if you have infrastructure, you have cellular infrastructure, then it's better to manage the interference. So the comparison has to be done at the physical and the MAC la layer to be able to really capture what is the performance of the two technologies. So if we talk of the physical layer, Actually, this is an example from one source, but you can have, find other in the literature. Actually, at the physical layer, when we plot the blocker rate as a function of the signal-to-noise ratio, LTE V2X outperforms A.211P. It's not a surprise at the end of the day, A.211P is a relatively old technology. For example, it uses convolutional codes at the physical layer, whereas LTEV incorporates turbo codes. So yes, at the physical layer, independently of the difference in performance, depending on the source, there is certainly a gain from the LTV to X. But we really need to consider the Mac, especially when you're talking V2V in a distributed system. So 8.11p uses a well-known carrier sense multiple access Mac with collision avoidance. So basically, a vehicle that wants to transmit first sends the channel. If the channel is free, it transmits. If it's not free, it implements a protocol with back offs and so on to decide when to try again. The Mac of LTV 2 x is a bit more complicated. So let me first explain you how it's organized the usage of the wireless channel. The channel is divided first in one millimeter, one millimeter subframes and in the frequency domain in 100 kilohertz bandwidth resource blocks. These resource blocks are then combined to create a subchannel where a vehicle will actually transmit its data and some very important header, the side link control information that other vehicles need to receive in order to be able to decode the transmitted packet. In terms of the packet actually can occupy one subchannel or can occupy two subchannels depending on the size. In terms of the MAC layer itself, it's also sensing base. So a vehicle that implements LTE V2X it is continuously sensing the channel. But the key feature is that it's semi-persistent, which means that once a vehicle will select a subchannel, it will maintain the selection. So basically the first transmission is like a reservation, but it's not a permanent, it's a semi-persistent. So it will reserve the subchannel for a given number of transmissions. So the way it works is like this. Let's suppose a vehicle has a packet to transmit and the packet has a given deadline. It will then try to select one of the subchannels within this selection window. The vehicle is permanently sensing the previous transmissions and it takes into account the previous second, okay? What it has sensed from other vehicles in the previous second. The thing is that, as I mentioned, it's semi-persistent. So a vehicle, when it selects a subchannel, it reserves it and it's an, it announces the reservation to other vehicles. So I can, for example, detect that two vehicles say it here that they plan to reserve this subchannel here. So if I sense this explicit reservation, I will discard these two subchannels as potential candidates. In addition, I will discard subchannels that even though nobody has explicitly reserved the subchannel, the receive signal level is too high and therefore it will interfere with my transmission. And this is how they end up constructing or identifying the available resources in the selection window. Out of these available resources, they will rank them and randomly select at the end one of the best 20%. Best being the one with lower received signal level, okay? So when it has selected a channel, it will reserve it. It will reserve it with what we call the resource reservation interval. So it will basically say, I'm going to utilize the subchannel 100 milliseconds later. 
and I can reserve it up to a number of transmissions that is randomly selected between 5 and 50. Okay? This is just so that we can then understand exactly the comparison. So let's look then at what is the performance of the two technologies, talking of the packet delivery ratio. So this is a system level analysis. Okay, we're not talking of a single uh, v uh, V2V transmission. And we consider that vehicles are broadcasting these awareness messages. I do it with the European standard, but similar trends will be observed with the US standard of BSMs rather than CAMs. And I consider the highway scenario. Here is the packet delivery ratio as a function of the distance between transmitter and receiver with the two technologies considering the general assumptions in terms of evaluation. In particular, the assumptions under 3GPP that specifies in one technical document how the technology should be evaluated. And the main thing is that it considers periodic traffic. So it considers that vehicles are going to transmit periodically their awareness messages and they will be of fixed size. Some models consider a single fixed size, some models consider two sizes, okay? We can see that actually LTE V2X outperforms the Wi-Fi candidate technology. The problem is that recently, recently being the end of last year, two OEMs reported for the first time traces of real CAM messages of units embedded in production vehicles. So I'm not talking a guy, uh, a researcher with a computer having an onboard unit. No, no, I'm saying an onboard unit integrated into a car, connected to the CAN, connected to the sensors, and transmitting this awareness message as specified in Etsy standard and in the car-to-car -car communication profile. The, I will talk about the two OEMs are Volkswagen and Renault. Okay, they have these traces in this document for highway scenarios, uh, urban, suburban, uh, et cetera. So it's for different scenarios. The main finding of this, uh, this measurement campaign is that the CAM messages are not periodic. This is the PDF of the time between awareness message that vehicles will transmit. Yes, we can see that there are some intervals, 400 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, that are more frequent, but it's certainly not periodic because we can go from 100 to even one second for the transmission of these awareness messages. In addition, if we look at the PDF of the CAN size, actually the most frequent size is 200 bytes, but there are other frequent sizes as well. In addition, that is not, in, uh, not uh, you cannot see in these figures, actually there is a correlation between the time messages are, trans are generated and the size of these messages. If you are interested, we got access to these traces and we're working on producing a CAM traffic model that hopefully will, will give uh, uh, open to the community in a couple, uh, one or two months. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to get in touch. So what happens when we analyze the performance of the two technologies considering this realistic non-periodic traffic? Here is again the PDR as a function of the distance between transmitter and receiver for a moderate to low ch uh, channel load. The channel load is measured here with the channel busy ratio, which is the percentage of time that a vehicle senses the channel as busy, okay? 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 is, uh, we consider moderate to low, and a moderate to high, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. The main finding, and this is again also something relatively new, is that actually Wi-Fi is significantly better than LTE V2X or cellular V2X. And actually, the performance improvement strongly increases with the load. The reason is that the 3GPP standard has been designed from start to end assuming periodic traffic. So when a vehicle selects a subchannel, it notifies other that is going to reserve it. The problem is that it doesn't know really when the next packet is going to be generated. So if I reserve it, First of all, I'm blocking the usage of this subchannel by other vehicles. So indirectly, I'm reducing the capacity of the channel because I don't let anybody else to use it. In addition, if I don't use it, and I use this subchannel 300 milliseconds later, because I didn't transmit any message on the subchannel that I said I'm going to reserve it, I don't notify others that I'm going to actually use it 300 milliseconds later. So actually, it's completely useless the semi-persistent reservation, and collisions happen all the time. In addition, if my packet is of larger size, let's suppose I reserve a subchannel at a given moment in time, and later on the packet is of higher size, you have seen in the PDF that the size can actually vary between different values, then the reservation is useless again, and I have to reserve. So that explains why actually 8.211p, that is much simpler, but much more flexible, outperforms cellular V2X. 
And we can see that there is a crossing point. And the crossing point is repetitive, but actually the crossing point increases the, with the distance. The reason being is that at the end of the day, the final performance depends on two types of errors, physical layer and MAC errors. When the MAC errors are dominant, then 802.11p or Wi-Fi outperforms cellular V2x. And when the physical layer errors are dominant, then because LTE V2x has a better physical layer, it outperforms 802.11p. The higher the load, the more distance will the MAC errors be actually relevant. But anyway, independently of which technology is better, we have to be aware that these technologies have been designed from the start for basic active advanced driver assistance systems. So the idea is to transmit some basic awareness messages. In the community, several groups, including ours, have already expressed the concern in terms of scalability and reliability of both technologies. This concern will only increase when we take into account that connected automated driving with all this collective perception or cooperative driving maneuvers are actually going to increase the bandwidth demand because all these messages are certainly of higher size than a few hundred bytes. So what is the connectivity roadmap? Actually, both communities, Wi-Fi and cellular, are already working on evolving their current technologies. In the case of the Wi-Fi, recently, that is this year, IEEE approved what we call the Next Generation V2X Study Group that is going to produce the standard that we call 802.11bd. The main driver for 802.11bd is to improve performance, but preserving the investments that OEMs are doing in 802.11p. So the idea, according to the, to the PAR of IEEE, is to make modifications at the physical and MAC layer in the 5.9 gigahertz band, and interestingly, in the millimeter wave band. Some people, when we say millimeter wave B2X, say, wow, why? Why millimeter wave? This is impossible. But the automotive industry is very used to work with the millimeter wave bands. All our radars, short, mid, long range radars, work in the millimeter wave band. But it's the first time that explicitly it introduces the option of Vegas to communicate in the millimeter wave band. They are not reinventing the wheel. The basic idea is to take improvement that have been done in standards such as 802.11n, AC, or AX, and incorporate them into the vehicle standards. So we're talking standards like introducing LDPC for error correction, higher order modulation, and so on. The key thing is that the standard establishes that the, the new 802.11b shall provide interoperability, coexistence, backward compatibility, and fairness, this basically reads with 802.11p devices. So basically this means that first, both devices have to communicate on the same channel. They have to be able to detect each other. This means that the new vehicle that will have 802.11bd, the preamble of the messages must be the preamble of 802.11p. The objective is that by maintaining the preamble, all vehicles can detect my transmission. They will not be able to decode it, but I will, at least they will detect it so that we avoid packing collisions. In addition, 802.11bd must be able to transmit to communicate with all devices. So it must have a communication mode that is basically 802.11p. Okay? On the cellular domain, the evolution is driven by 5G. I'm not going to give you a tutorial on 5G, but just a glimpse of some key technologies that you have heard many times. Basically, the idea of 5G new radio is to introduce flexibility at all layers, okay? So at the physical layer, basically this means an scalable OFDM interface and the usage, flexible users of resources both in the frequency and time domain. So you are not stick to this one, milli, one millisecond subframe. You can actually have shorter ones and, and so on. And it also introduces the option of sub six gigahertz, which is the standard cellular uh, bandwidth, but also introduces for the first time the utilization of millimeter wave band in the cellular domain, okay? Some innovations of 5G that are very important for vehicle are first of all, MEC. The possibility to do more processing closer to the vehicle. That reduces the latency and that is certainly very important for time critical applications in the vehicular domain. And in addition, the, the flexibility introduced by the softwareization. The softwareization of 5G with SDN and FHV introduces the option of network slicing. From the radio access network perspective, network slicing is basically being able to configure the resources the way you want it to serve different users that have different demands, whether it's uh, ultra-reliable link latency, massive, 
uh, machine type communications or mobile broadband, okay? But this is the normal 5G. Actually, there is yet no 5G V2X. 5G and R V2X is currently under standardization. So actually, it's work that is currently being doing in release 16. The intention is to finalize the standard at the end of this year, okay? So it's not yet final, but a few, a few ideas or a few key points about 5G and R V2X. First of all, it's going to reduce most of the physical layer features of the uplink connection of 5G and R. So again, we are not reinventing the wheel. It introduces for the first time the possibility to do multicast communications. Previous standards are basically broadcast transmission mostly. And it will introduce two modes at the MAC level. Mode one is the replacement of mode three for LTV2X, so where basically is the infrastructure, the one that manages the channels. The main novelty here that we will have is that it will introduce the option of doing grant-free scheduling. Grant-free scheduling is when a node does not have to request a channel. The network estimates the demand of the user and pre-assigns the channel in advance to reduce basically the latency. And mode two is going to be the replacement for mode four. And basically, although it's yet not designed, is working to eliminate the inefficiency that I previously mentioned with a periodic traffic. So although they have not publicly <laughs> released or uh, uh, publicly analyzed cellular V2X under non-aperiodic traffic in the presentations they made uh, for, for promoting cellular V2X, is, implicitly, is an implicit acknowledgement the fact that the next generation standard they are modifying to basically avoid this inefficiency. But the key thing is uh, 5G and RV2X will not replace LTE V2X. So the idea is not to do backward interoperability at the technology radio level. Their idea is that the 5G and RV2X will address the use cases of autonomous driving that higher bandwidth demand and the basic safety applications will still be done with LTE V2X. So in reality, there is no backward compatibility and the compatibility will be at the device level using two radios, which introduces, by the way, many problems as well because you have to do a multiplexing in either of time or frequency when a device is going to transmit with one technology or the other. So the connectivity roadmap, we actually have an evolution from the two camps. The cellular with cellular V2X or LTE V2X, then 5G and R radio and the millimeter wave band, and as well with the Wi-Fi camp that has 802.11p, NG, NGV, and millimeter wave. The idea is that first generations are focused on coverage and availability and lower data rates, whereas the evolutions are first focused on improving the data rate, but to ultimately improve to very high data rates, then you have to reduce the coverage, and for that you will utilize millimeter wave. The interesting thing is that actually this connectivity roadmap matches very well the vehicular roadmap. When we move from basic safety services to more advanced rich sensor data sharing, 3D dynamic map, map data sharing that usually require much larger bandwidth, but also lower uh, communication range. So actually there is a very good mapping from these two roadmaps. It's true that some people uh, or think that when you, the problem with these roadmaps is what will happen with my old cars when you start introducing this new technology? This is re a real problem and it's a problem that is never going to be solved unless the real SDR software defined radio paradigm was really feasible. But there are also, so we have to live with that. So we have to find solutions that will maintain certain backward compatibility as we improve the standards. But there is also a lot of potential from this multi-link and multi-rat ecosystem. And I will finalize with two examples of our own research of this potential where I stay at relatively high concept level. The first one is to address the scalability challenge. As I mentioned before, whether it's Wi-Fi or ITS G5, the European name, or cellular V2X, the problem of these kinds of, of scenarios is that if every vehicle tries to communicate at the same time, the channel will end up collapsing. However, if vehicles had different communication capabilities, then we could exploit these communication capabilities to basically offload the transmission to the different technologies. This is a very well-known 
uh, concept, the heterogeneous networking concept. But the key problem has always been in V2V that is completely decentralized, no infrastructure to decide which technology to use, is how to make an heterogeneous V2V algorithm where vehicles select the technology they will use to transmit. They can all listen at the same time in different technologies, is how to do that in a distributed environment without making the system completely unstable. Okay? And this is basically what we have been doing in this paper, if you are interested, it will be available shortly, is how to do this heterogeneous V2V low distribution in a completely stable manner. And the key has been to extend the concept of cooperative perception to the case of V2X. If V2X is going to be for vehicles in the future an additional sensor, then v uh, vehicles should be able to exchange information about the load they are experiencing on every communication technology they have. Using this information is how we have been able to use to do an heterogeneous V2V algorithm that is completely stable. The other challenge that I mentioned about was bandwidth. Okay, the need to have significantly bar larger bandwidth. For example, in cooperative perception in Europe, we are currently exchanging the objects. But there are certain people that would like to, to exchange the raw sensor data, not 200 meters away, but maybe 30, 40 meters away. Currently, there is no other option than using millimeter wave. Okay, even 5G and R will probably collapse. The problem of millimeter wave V2X is the usage of a high frequency band. High frequency band has a high path loss and penetration load, and therefore the availability of the link between vehicles is uncertain. Whether being due to an obstruction of a building or even a vehicle in between can actually obstruct a millimeter wave V2V communication. You can compensate these propagation losses using, using directional antennas. Basically, you use beamforming to concentrate your energy in a given direction, and therefore you compensate the propagation losses. The problem is that this has certain overhead. For vehicles to be able to direct their antennas, there is a certain overhead until you find what is the right direction. And this overhead increases when you introduce mobility, because not only you need to do beam forming, but also you need to do beam tracking. As the vehicle moves along, you have to detect the movement and move your beam. You have also many challenges with respect to scheduling. Let's suppose that this millimeter wave vehicle communicates with this other vehicle, this one is receiving, and this vehicle wants to transmit to vehicle B. Because of the use of directional antennas, this vehicle A, E, is not going to be able to detect that actually B is, has its antenna directed to vehicle A, so we have a scheduling conflict. So together with colleagues from Rutgers uh, in the US, we have proposed a solution that exploits this availability of multiple technologies that will happen in vehicles anyway. Uh, I, I do believe that there is no single technology that you could have on vehicles deployed and they will be able to sustain all these services. And our proposal is actually to decouple the millimeter wave data and control planes. So the idea is that all the control functions, such as beamforming, detecting the availability or not of a link, and the scheduling, and scheduling if is offloaded to the sub-6 gigahertz V2S communication technology. This technology will have to be there anyway because most of the basic active services, what they need is broadcast omnidirectional transmissions. They don't need high data rates. So the sub-6 gigahertz V2S transmission will have to be there. So basically, we offload these control functions to these technologies and we utilize the large range omnidirectional and broadcast nature of these transmissions to be all able to solve all the overhead and control problems that millimeter wave has. If you are interested, the solution is actually available in this paper. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for su such interesting talk. Uh, any questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm, so you've told us about several applications that will happen in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And um, can you elaborate a bit on the delay requirements that we'll have, also seeing how when those, these applications change? Because yesterday we had a keynote where we were talking a lot about delay requirements and what is acceptable and mm -hmm. also in combination with coding. So can you maybe explain us in these concrete scenarios what okay. kind of delay is tolerable and what not? To be honest, um, I think... Um, Sometimes there has been a bit of exaggeration of requirements. Um, 
most basic active safety applications do not require one millisecond, five milliseconds latency. I mean, a vehicle does not move that much in 100 milliseconds. So uh, if you uh, spotted in one of the figures, I said the latency. And the latency is usually considered in the vehicular domain 100 milliseconds. For that, it's sufficient for most active safety applications. If you're going to other kind of applications, uh, for example, the um, remote control of autonomous vehicles, then certainly you need much lower latency and very good synchronization, by the way. Uh, whether one millisecond, five milliseconds, I, I, I haven't seen any particular figures of what you need to be able to remotely control a vehicle. The jitter is a big problem, okay? But the latency, probably five, 10 milliseconds will be more than enough. I have an experience with that. Some other people maybe in the audience have. Uh, but I think for most of day one, day two applications, uh, latency levels of 100 milliseconds will be probably uh, sufficient. The teleoperated driving is probably the use case that requires a more radical latency with the infrastructure uh, at the infrastructure level. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. So I have a question regarding the uh, introduction of 5G uh, millimetric wave within the uh, within vehicle environment. So uh, when we introduce this uh, technology, this means that we uh, increase the data rate, mm -hmm. uh, but we have only one control channel. Mm -hmm. uh, if um, the question is, for example, uh, when we when we increase the data rate, mm -hmm. is there any uh, risk to uh, increase the, the uh, congestion uh, within the uh, control channel, as we have only one control channel and four service channels? Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, first point is, 5G and RV2X at the millimeter wave band is not going to be introduced in the release of 16. So they have deferred that to release 17. So it will take a bit more time. Um, the multi-channel uh, of one control and several service channel is for the sub-6 gigahertz band. But a key point in what you measure of the congestion is, first, to avoid saturating the control. Whatever is this control channel for millimeter wave band, it's true that if we do millimeter wave communications with, for example, how the eight, eight the AD standard does it, you will collapse the control channel. That's why, why? Because the beam forming, you have to, every time you move, you have to do all the, the testing of all the possible beams until you find the right one. And it moves again and you have to redo it again. That's why our proposal is to offload these control functions and do them in an omnidirectional and broadcast channel so that you don't need to do this directive control all the time. However, also, when you use millimeter wave, one key advantage of millimeter wave with the directional communications is that you can spatially reuse the channel. This means that compared to sub-6 gigahertz where one vehicle that transmits, everybody around should not be transmitted on the same channel at the same time. One key feature of millimeter wave is that if I transmit in this direction, and another vehicle, for example, in the back, could reutilize the same channel at the same time because these directive communications introduce the possibility of doing a special reuse. But on the control function, a current millimeter wave standard will collapse in a vehicular environment. You need to do something different. Any other? Thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, my question is that you said uh, even a milli millisecond time matters a lot while uh, an automated vehicle mm -hmm. is moving, and that too it's moving along with other vehicles. So it's very important to take the decisions immediately. So the, my question is that uh, when a vehicle is communicating with other vehicle and the roadside units, so obviously it will be receiving hundreds of messages, and it is important to verify the authenticity of the messages before it takes any decision. Mm -hmm. And of course, there will be an overhead of processing these security parameters like signing hundreds of messages and verifying hundreds of messages. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that the methods, whatever you have proposed, so they already take care of these unexpected variable delays or uh, it's already taken care already? Or And another question is that you talked about uh, some of the standards. So is there any specific part of the standard that 
takes care of the security aspect of V2X communication. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I'm not a security expert myself. Uh, in uh, IEEE, uh, um, this is called the 1609, I believe, point two, uh, is the standard that defines the security privacy that has to be done uh, in V2X communications. In our case, um, we consider security by the additional overhead that security is going to uh, generate on the occupancy of the channel, okay? Uh, we don't consider uh, the latency related to the uh, authentication with the infrastructure because there has to be one infrastructure that authenticates. And that is, for example, one key advantage of cellular, the capacity to do uh, ubiquitous authentication of vehicles without requiring Wi-Fi roadside units deployed. Um, so that will certainly add some delay for the vehicle to authenticate with the infrastructure, but it will not necessarily add a delay for every transmission of vehicle to vehicle, okay? Uh, the impact on vehicle to vehicle, where we're mainly focused here, is on the additional bytes that the security and privacy will, uh, will generate on the transmission. And uh, I think uh, 3GPP certainly has a V2X security, but I don't know exactly the, the number of the document. Sorry for that. Thing on the back. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question. You introduced two no types of new messages, collective perception and maneuver coordination. Mm -hmm. Have you already thought about the channel allocation of these two messages? Okay, this is, um, today, this is not yet defined, okay? Uh, we have a, a dilemma here, is that, for collective perception to really work, the messages have to be of broadcast nature. Uh, because you cannot know when to expect another vehicle around. So it cannot be dedicated unicast transmissions. So uh, we're working with the assumption that they have to be broadcast. And in the current channelization, uh, whether Wi-Fi or, or cellular, because actually cellular is reusing the same channelization, the only broadcast uh, channel by nature is the control channel. So what we're saying, and this is based also on some of this analysis that I showed about collective perception, is that um, we are defining the messages without a holistic view of what is really going to happen when you will have the complete ecosystem of messages working. So we are already introducing the need to do a multi-channel operation for the coexistence of these messages, not only between them, but also with CAM messages, the basic awareness. There is yet not a decision made, and it's a bit of a challenge because probably if you need broadcast transmissions for both of them, by the way, cooperative maneuvering, they are also defining, we're also defining them as broadcast in nature from the start. Then a single control channel of 10 megahertz, I don't think it will work. Uh, so probably you will require some kind of two channels. But in the end, for example, this is the approach of cellular. Because cellular LTE V2X is going to do the basic awareness in 10 megahertz channel. But 5G and R V2X that is going to handle the cooperative perception and maneuver coordination services, by definition of the standard, is going to be done in a different channel. Because you're going to, they are not compatible at the physical and max. So by, by the de design of the standard itself, it requires a different channel. So they will have, in the cellular domain, if, if you utilize the cellular, you will have two channels by default. In the Wi-Fi domain, it has not been decided, but I do think you will need to broadcast channels. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Okay. I think the presentation, uh, as nice as it was, will generate a lot of discussion. So I invite you to contact Javier. Uh, on the side and ask him whatever questions you have. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you.